With all of the expectations that were building for the final map in Black Ops 3, the developers had an almost impossible task in front of them. That big transition that zombies had been going through was now starting to slow down and the new style was pretty well defined. And the community that had stuck around for that new style was almost by definition die hard and obsessed. The kind of people who enjoyed the gameplay of spending hours looking at every single corner of every map and watching YouTube videos to find all those little secrets were obviously the same kind of people who would be very prone to getting, probably to be honest, overhyped about any little hint they were given about future content. And Treyarch was giving a lot more than just tiny hints. There was a massive advertising push for Revelations, more than any other map in history. There were teasers across all the different social media, there was viral marketing with a bunch of YouTubers getting involved and in putting a puzzle together, there were multiple full trailers, and they hired big name actor Malcolm McDowell to deliver all kinds of omniscient, ominous voice lines. Everything was pointing to this map coming out and being the ultimate zombies experience. And in a lot of ways it was, the storytelling and the gameplay were both explicitly designed to feel like a culmination of everything that had come before. There are some valid criticisms of how the map achieved both of those things that I do think are worth talking about, but in the end I think it succeeded at what it was trying to do, a lot more than the community at large tends to give it credit for. It was really effective in how it conveyed the feeling that this was what the past eight years of zombies had all been leading up to, and it was a touching celebration of the mode and also of the fans who had poured their passion into it over all those years. Oh my god! This is exactly what I asked for! Like, uh, how I missed you, Shay! Oh, he come out of the freaking temple! Oh. <laughs> My favorite map of all time. Oh my gosh, dude, that's safe. That was safe. That was safe. That was safe. <laughs> it's back. <laughs> yes. Ah. The biggest strength and weakness of Revelations, depending on how you feel about it, is that it relies very, very, very heavily on repurposing and reusing content from all across the history of the mode. It was in the layout, with how the entire map, other than the Pack-a-Punch room and the spawn area, was built out of sections of past maps melded together. You could walk straight from the trenches of Origins directly into Alcatraz, or be running from a horde deeper and deeper into the Dereisendrache catacombs and end up coming out in the Kino Drototen Theater. And they're not just sterile environments to pass through either, you're meant to feel like you're actually visiting each space. It goes so far that the ambient noise and even the round change jingles are contextual and match the map you're standing in. And then, in the center of all that, the physical heart of the map was also the metaphorical heart, the core the whole mode was built around. Nacht der Untoten. Now, it wasn't perfect. Some of those transitions were incredible, where they put the work in to rework the geometry so that one map led gradually and almost unnoticeably into the next one. But on a macro scale, the outer ring of the map was broken up into four totally distinct islands, and same thing with the Pack-a-Punch room and the central hub. So at all times through the whole game, four-fifths of the map was always completely inaccessible unless you used a jump pad or a teleporter that really broke up the flow of the action. As players, just looking at the end product, we can't know if there was some technical limitation or an issue with the segments physically fitting together, or if they just really wanted that aesthetic of a bunch of different rocks floating around in space, and they knew they were sacrificing cohesion to get it. Whatever it was, I don't think you can say it was just them being lazy, because they obviously weren't, there was so much effort on display everywhere else outside of the jump pads. None of the individual segments of past maps were actually just cross sections that were directly copied and pasted. They were tweaked all over the place to make a new experience so that they flowed better in their new context. There were the new areas in the back of Verrucht, or the way that Origins was changed to bring the mound closer to a different Generator 3 layout with new verticality. The theater from Kino is one example where it's almost a completely new space with all the new ramps that crisscross around it that completely change the flow. The constant teleports and jump pads are frustrating from a map design perspective, but I think in the end it balances out and it still does do its job. 
It works as both a nostalgic spectacle and a set of actually functional, playable game spaces. And I don't think that you can in good faith say that any of them actually play like the maps they're taken from. The enemy design had that same philosophy, both in terms of bringing old things back and the way it wasn't just some things, but what felt like almost everything we'd ever seen. To the point that it felt like less of a tailored, crafted experience where special enemies were very carefully designed to have a specific gameplay purpose. It was more just them having fun with it and seeing how far they could go. For boss enemies, Margwas were back, and again, just like the map itself, they weren't just a lazy copy and paste. They went back and put some work in so that they were able to have the nostalgia of a returning enemy, but while still feeling novel and still bringing something new to the table. This time, whenever one spawned in, it could be the basic one we'd already seen, or it could be one of two new variants with new ranged capabilities. There was a fire-based version that when it did its ground pound, it could send out a streak of fire that tracked towards you and any zombies that it hit along the way would be set up to explode when they died. Or there was the Void Margwa that harnessed the power of the Demon Bow and could summon those skulls to fly towards you and mess with your movement. Back on Shadows of Evil, a single type of Margwa was enough to make for a complete experience. Even after tripling that here, that still wasn't enough for what they were trying to do, so they also included Panzer Soldats alongside them. In Shadows of Evil, the Margwa's whole purpose was to be a one-to-one -one replacement of the Origins Panzer. They're both a tanky boss that spawns alongside the zombies instead of during its own round, and they have a dangerous melee slam and a big glowing weak point. They serve the exact same purpose, there's no gameplay reason to have them both, they only switched to match the aesthetic differences between the maps. So the only reason they had both here was again for a story reason, it was to give you the player the sense that this was a complete onslaught against every enemy you'd ever faced. The max ammo rounds had the only 100% new enemy with the Furies, and even they were pretty similar to the Nova Crawlers from Moon with how they were lower to the ground and then teleported at you to get hits in. Plus, they still shared those max ammo rounds with the Parasites, which we'd definitely seen before. And if you hung out inside the Apothecon for long enough, you'd start to see spiders again too. I think the fact that this is the Zetsubo no Shima representation on the map instead of the Thrashers is really revealing as to what the developers' intentions were with Revelations. They already had both Margwas and Panzers, so it's not like they were against throwing more big bosses into the pool. But the Thrashers were a bit more controversial than those other two, with the player perception being that they were annoying and not fun and there wasn't even a reward to make up for it. So, they might have been left out just because they didn't fit into the environment with there not being any of those gas spores that spawned them, but I think at least part of it is that this map was supposed to be a celebration playing only the biggest hits. It was a lot like Buried, where the whole point was to focus purely on fun. They weren't stretching their game design muscles here and worrying about any balance, they were just presenting players with a playground full of things that they were 100% sure that they'd enjoy. So, even if they did stand by the Thrasher's implementation on Zetsubo in that context, here they were just avoiding giving players any reason to have a bad taste in their mouth. Then, it was the same thing with the weapon selection, where instead of giving players something new, they let them choose from a buffet of a bunch of different things from the past. If you had Mule Kick, your loadout could be a Thunder Gun, and an Apothecan Servant, and a Ray Gun, with Lil Arnie's as a Tactical, and the Ragnarok DG4 as your Specialist. Again, there was no perfectly tuned difficulty curve here that they were trying to keep players riding on the entire length of the match. No Shadows of Evil or Zetsubo no Shima style setup phase that you had to stress and optimize your way through to earn the good stuff. This was a map where you could just get the Apothecan Servant out of the box on round 3 and be set until round 50. It even did the same thing as Buried with Juggernog by making it accessible right off the bat. It was in Noct, and it was the only perk machine that was powered on by default, so you could get it in the first two or three rounds and then get right into the fun part, you didn't have to worry about missing that essential perk. They weren't only reminding players of all the good times they'd had in the past, they were also doing a lot of work to remove all the barriers to entry so you could also have a good time now. 
Although, simple isn't exactly the same thing as easily accessible. There was absolutely zero buildable weaponry on the map, so you could get all these wonder weapons, but the only way to do it was by getting repeatedly lucky and getting every single one out of the box individually. Even the Ragnaroks came fully formed as just another thing in the rotation. Before now, all of the specialists had been locked behind side quests that all had at least one obscure step, so this might be the first time a super casual player might have gotten to play with one. And that's good, this map was literally built on the backs of World at War and Black Ops 1 maps, so it definitely was a goal for the developers that players who enjoyed that era could enjoy this celebration of it too. But at the same time, the mode had undeniably evolved since those days. Buildable wonder weapons do raise the skill floor, and that kind of does lock out the most casual tier of players, but it also gives you the opportunity to be consistently at least competent in your games and have a baseline for your level of success. Being so completely reliant on the box felt almost antiquated at this point. Bad RNG being a 100% impassable progression blocker just didn't feel good now that we'd had a taste of what felt like a better way of doing it. Now, it wasn't the end of the world when Gorod Krovi had a box wonder weapon, and for the casual gameplay that this map is really designed for, it's not a huge deal here either. But there is one case where that's not true, and that's if you go into a game planning on doing the easter egg, you can start to feel some of that frustration. You 100% need both the Lil Arnies and the Apothecan Servant back to back for the second step, and by then you probably want to have the Thunder Gun too for dealing with Margwas. There's just nothing you can do to speed up that process, your entry into the main quest is just hard gated by RNG. It isn't the main gameplay case for most players most of the time, so again, it is fine. But when you do have one of those bad runs through no fault of your own, you do start to understand the value of at least giving players the option to work around it. And that's actually the middle ground that a lot of maps in Black Ops 4 found. Some wonder weapons were in the box if you wanted to bash your head against it for a while, but there were also optional quests where experienced players could still find a way to earn them at their own pace. But that's not even close to what most people's actual biggest problem with Revelations is. The one that you'll hear the most is the inherent risk of the core concept of a map that brings stuff back and is based in nostalgia. The other side of that coin is that the map was so full of references and they put so much work into celebrating the past at every opportunity that there wasn't a lot of room left for innovation. The criticism boils down to the idea that it's a map really built for the first week of release. It is a cool and emotional journey to explore all the different areas for the first time, and it's exciting every time you notice a new little detail. But the question is, does it hold up once you've found all of those things, and you now have to play it as just a map instead of a museum? I think there are some valid points here, but there are also some that get blown out of proportion. There are things like the Ragnaroks being brought back, which definitely aren't great. The specialist weapon was one thing where we had started to be able to expect something new and very unique with every new map, kind of taking that role over from perks after Black Ops 3 had slowed down on introducing new ones. So it was a bit of a disappointment here to just get a single old one just kind of dumped on you unceremoniously out of the box. Or the shield, being the guard of Fafnir again, seems like not a big deal in practice because it's a shield, same as anything else, but it comes across as a bit lazy or at the very least immersion breaking. From the very beginning, the shield had always had little visual touches to tie it to each map. Just flavor things like transits being built out of a car door versus mob using prison bars. Gorod Krovis was the one that was the most tied to its map, it was so specific to the dragon theming, both visually and also practically with the fire breath immunity. Having it here, where there are no dragons, does stand out as very obviously just a reused asset instead of something brought back for a specific purpose. But then, I think some of the other criticisms do start to fall off a bit. Basically no new enemies, or 90% reused areas, are true statements at the most surface level, but I've already talked about how I think there was actually a lot of work put into both of those things to make them feel pretty fresh given what they were working with. They had the aesthetics of nostalgia at first glance, but under the hood they did add some depth there. 
saying that the final boss is anticlimactic because it's only 30 seconds long, or just the same thing as the Shadows of Evil fight, ignores that that part of it is just the final stage of a three-phase boss fight, and the first part is a totally new fight in the most dynamic arena we'd ever seen. Of course, it is disappointing to not get a new wonder weapon, but again, their way of making up for it was with breadth. Yes, there wasn't one brand new thing, but we'd also never been allowed to play around with the amount of things that were available here, so it was new in that way. That's actually the best way to look at a lot of the different things in Revelations. A lot of the things it did weren't 100% brand new with zero precedent in any other map. That's what a lot of people were expecting, and in some ways that is super fair. The past two finale maps were Moon and then Origins, two of the most ambitious maps ever. Both of them felt like they broke all the rules of the zombies formula, going to places we never thought were possible and bringing in dozens of totally unique features. So, if that's the scale you're measuring Revelations against, it makes sense that it comes across as a failure. But that wasn't what Revelations was trying to do. The goal of the design just wasn't the same as those other maps. Instead, it was that idea of excess. It was still trying new things and exploring the boundaries of the mode, but what was new about it was just how much was in there, how saturated every single part of the experience was. Instead of a handful of truly new things, they turned up the volume on everything that had existed before. Things like the impractical amount of different enemies, or having two of the most overpowered wonder weapons of all time. Or that this was the map with the most ciphers ever, and they were also the most difficult, with ten of them still being unsolved to this day, and they probably never will be. Where most of the recent maps had one of those wearable helmets, and the most we'd ever seen at a time was three, this one had almost triple that. There was something to give you damage reduction from pretty much every combination of enemies, some were intermediaries that helped you get stronger ones later, and a lot of them had perma-perk-like effects with improved stamina up or juggernaut. The Holy Grail was the Apothecan God Mask that let you have a full 10 hits worth of health. And every single one had its own unique little side quest to unlock it, like the God Mask you had to kill a bunch of every kind of enemy all in a tight area, kind of proving that you'd mastered everything the map could throw at you. It was down to tiny things like the radio in Noct, the site of the first ever musical easter egg in Zombies. Back then, it just played some reused campaign music. Now, in the spirit of making everything more, you could get that same radio to play a full playlist of almost every easter egg song in the history of the mode. Even the super easter egg was a supercharged version of what it had been in the past. First, there was Moon, where one player had to have done the Call of the Dead and Shangri-La easter eggs, with the reward just being that you could progress that last quest. In Black Ops 2, that evolved to where every player had to do all of the Victus easter eggs, and now there were tangible rewards for it. You got to have a full game of effects like foregun inventory or permanent fire sale before your progress reset after that one match. Here, they took one more huge step up. First of all, you got almost a full prestige worth of XP, and every game after that on every map, you spawned in with an RK5 on top of your starting pistol, and they both came with full reserve ammo. As a permanent reward, it felt a lot better matched to the work that you had to put in, a way to permanently level up your character and something you could brag about instead of just a single game of goofing off. And it's not just that that one was bigger and better, but there were actually really two super easter eggs, with the spark that only spawned in when you finished every other quest except Revelations itself. You got one chance per game to carry this thing from spawn to Samantha's room without getting hit, and if you could do it, every gun you got out of the box or off the wall was automatically pack-a-punched. Not only that, it also unlocked Takeo's Katana, a melee weapon that was a one-hit kill until the mid-40s. Now, there was a reason for all that excess. It wasn't just the developers bragging about all the cool stuff they did in the past. It truly did feel like it was built out of love for the players, like there was so much stuff in there because they wanted to give us as much as they could out of appreciation for how much we'd put into the mode. 
You could see that super clearly in how some of the side quests felt like they were built explicitly to reward the most passionate fans first. There was one easter egg where players could unlock a table that allowed you to share weapons between yourselves to help cut down on box RNG by letting players pool resources. To get it, you had to move chalk drawings around the map to their cannon locations, so the people who could solve it were obviously the people who had put the time in on those old maps, enough to know where even the non-gameplay related decorations went. Or, back on Shadows of Evil, the community had found some hints for an upgrade process for the Apothecan Servant, and so they put a lot of work into solving it. It ended up just being cut content, which was disappointing at the time, but then, in Revelations, there was an upgrade quest. It was this magical experience where it felt like they made rumors true, they validated the community, and kind of retroactively made all that work worth it. The main easter egg feels totally built on those ideas too, both the love and the depth of experience. It was by far the hardest egg to solve both before or since. No other map in the history of zombies has ever taken over a week to complete except this one. The casual round by round gameplay was some of the easiest because of all the overpowered stuff you could get, but with the quest, they went all out in the other direction. The community had to figure out things like the bone step, where there were six tiny rocks hidden not just around the already huge map, but mostly outside of the playable space. Not only that, they were almost indistinguishable from the already busy set dressing, it was mostly just a matter of trial and error. The developers were showing that they had faith, that they trusted the community was dedicated enough to be able to handle anything they could throw at us. Then there were other steps, like the second to last one that was kind of a farewell tour that gave you a chance to say goodbye to each of those old maps individually. Or the way that audio logs, which since World at War had been these optional, hidden things that you really had to go out of your way to find, were finally put front and center here with you having to play them during each of the first three steps. Just this one time, the story was made an integral part of the experience. The point is, it's more than just a hollow nostalgia trip. You really can feel the pride and the love being put into every single aspect of the map. And that's a good segue into what was really the last piece of the puzzle that is Revelations, the way it was the culmination of the story that Black Ops 3 had been pushing into being more and more of a core part of the mode. Everything about it was designed to feel like this was what everything else had all been leading up to the whole time. The map took place in Agartha, the nexus of the zombies universe. It was the house we saw in Kino, the paradise that Brock and Gary were searching for in Shangri-La, and the place where Samantha was guiding us from in Origins. None of it was actually the intention from the start, there were retcons with every new map and the story was always being written on the fly, but they found a way to tie it all together here and make it feel intentional. There was a real finality to it, at one point this was meant to be the end of the story. The cutscene explicitly said, the end, and it was a closed loop where the characters didn't really have anywhere else to go after that except through what we'd already seen. But even though that was true, of course it wasn't a perfect, satisfying, traditional ending where those characters were heroic and all the loose ends were perfectly tied up. It was a return to that narrative concept of cycles that they started exploring in Shangri-La and Mob of the Dead. They keep coming back to this idea because it's a way for the narrative to explore what's compelling about the gameplay. In general, although there were a few exceptions by now, you can't win at zombies. It's not like a campaign, there's no way to roll the credits on a map, no singular point where you can say that you're officially done with it. No matter what you do and what you accomplish, whether it be a round 100 or an easter egg completion or a challenge run, you're always going to quote unquote lose because you get that game over screen and you're always going to go back to the beginning. So the narrative has the characters go through that same experience. I do get why fans were frustrated at this at the time. Especially with Black Ops 3 making the story a lot more traditional and accessible, a lot more people were watching a lot more closely, and they expected the conclusion to that story to be accessible too. But it's important to say that it wasn't an intentional troll, or that the writers were incapable of writing a quote unquote good ending. It might not have been the most satisfying thing they could have done, but as a piece of art, it was the most interesting. 
One thing that Revelations definitely did have in common with Moon was how clearly they were both built as love letters to the fans. The entire time you're playing it, you can tangibly feel that the entire experience is optimized for making sure that you're having the most fun possible at all times. It was a celebration of the journey that we'd all been on together over the past eight years. And yes, to do that, there were a lot of returning elements. But I do truly believe that taking the map as a whole and not nitpicking individual elements, outside of a couple of the very worst examples, it does come together and coalesce into its own unique, fully realized new experience. It is nostalgia, but it doesn't feel hollow. They're not just throwing old stuff at you because they couldn't think of anything else. It was transformative in how they expanded almost everything they touched to make the most saturated experience to date, with dozens of sub-challenges and trials to keep players busy for a long time. And they were using that nostalgia very intentionally as a mirror back on the history of the mode. They wanted to provide a space where the players and the developers themselves could reflect on how we'd worked together to build the convoluted, engaging, diverse, and very unique experience that Zombies is today. <laughs>